Then I will turn in the yeah, yeah, I'll do it but so oh, unless you want to do it, but then you no, can do it. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, hope you had a good rest. We had a good celebration of Guillaume's birthday yesterday. A very good Portuguese restaurant, so that was nice. For the others, bad you could be with us, but uh, next time uh, we hope we can share that uh, with everybody. And so we are ready uh, for this uh, second day of our workshop. Um, I'm far from being a specialist of all these questions, actually, but I'm very happy to be here uh, to learn so much from all these great papers. And uh, talking about papers, I think we might just directly start with our first presenter today. So it uh, will be Mark Dyson from the Ateneo de Manila University. And uh, Mark will talk to us about droughts and volcanic eruptions, sources for a connected history of the 17th century crisis in Southeast and East Asia. So Mark, please. Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. Can I start? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, what I'm presenting today is very preliminary. It's, it's just more of an idea. I'm at a very preliminary stage more than anything. But in general, there has been this idea of this in the 17th century, you have this general state of crisis and collapse. And the typical historiography explains this in terms of the little ice age that the political, economic, and demographic collapse during this time at a global scale was largely due to the little ice age when the temperature dropped during this particular century. So at least, again, I'm not a particular expert in here, but generally when I look at the literature, most of it is a general description of the collapse in the 17th century, or there are very specific individual studies of the Little Ice Age in different specific areas, areas in Europe and especially in China. So my idea was, well, can you actually compare this and see if there, you have actual connections and disconnections that existed rather than looking at it from a general crisis at the global or regional scale. Sort of you look at it from a connected history, but with an environmental twist of the sort of this 17th century crisis that maybe if you look at these crises, maybe they are interrelated to one another in terms of how they adopted and reacted to one another. So maybe how different societies in the region adapted the environmental change of the 17th century. And perhaps, you know, we can unearth hidden connections through common experiences of droughts and volcanic eruptions or maybe even disconnections. When I submitted my title originally to Guillaume, I thought of co the connections, but at the same time, the more I thought about it, maybe there are disconnections because sometimes historians in Southeast Asia are very skeptical about, some of them are very skeptical about the Little Ice Age and the 17th century crisis in Southeast Asia. So maybe there are connections or disconnections. Just to give a very brief background, I think the common, Sort of the common denominator for sort of the Little Ice Age is the Maunder Minimum, which lasted from these particular dates. And usually that's usually the global cooling during the century, particularly in the middle of the 17th century, that they said led to these adverse weather, weather conditions that led to harvest failures, famines, epidemics, and high mortality in a lot of places around the group. And the reasoning is that these extreme weathers in the 17th century were due to the fluctuation in the number of sunspots. And there were people observing the number of sunspots. And from the 1640s to the 1710s, there were hardly any sunspots observable on the sun. So the, the logic is that there was a reduction in solar energy in the earth, which lowered the surface temperatures and led to extreme climatic events. And again, this is very, in terms of the archives of the resources, 
it's very different from what I'm used to because I'm trained as the sort of a classical historian. So you go to the archives where you have government documents. But if you look at, for example, environmental history, how do you reconstruct climate before instrumental records? And whether it's historians or paleoclimatologists, they actually use data uh, proxies. And it's the same for everybody. So you have proxy data to actually see what was the weather or the climate was during at that time. Classic examples would be the days of the first harvest of vine in vineyards, because usually if you have a delay in the harvest or in the vineyards, usually it meant there was a long winter, long, harsh winter. Same thing in Europe. They were tracking how many days were the canals frozen. So this would sort of be a proxy on whether there was how harsh the winter was. And the problem with these data is usually the further back you go in time, you would need to rely on non-numerical observations. And it also means, you know, it's very interdisciplinary. So you have paleoclimatologists being involved, historical climatologists, and you would see sometimes, you know, these scholarly works done as co-authored works, people working to, together sort of to find out historians working with climatologists to sort of unearth sort of the different archival sources. And generally, environmental historians have split the archives into the archives of nature and the archives of society. And usually what you usually track from what I've seen so far is that usually they seem to track variations in temperature and precip precipitation. And for the archives of nature, the usually what they use will be the different physical remains. So ice, cores, stalagmites, tree rings. And in the because we don't have the usually the ice in, in the tropics, usually the growth in the tree rings would be actually very helpful. Usually, if there's a strong growth in the tree ring, usually it would indicate high rainfall. And if there are thin rings, usually it would be a it signified droughts. But of course, you know, that was not always the case. Because especially in the tropics, from what I've read, the, the lack of the strong seasonality meant that the tree rings are usually not very prominent. So you have to find very specific types of trees that would actually have these sort of annual tree rings, which is not, which is very difficult to find. I think in, from what I've seen so far, they find some in Java, Thailand, and Vietnam. But the general consensus is, has, is that mid to late 1600s, there was a cooling. And this led to weaker monsoons and droughts and famines. And of course, you know, there, as I mentioned, there was a dearth of local paleoclimatic records. And I think one of the most famous is the one by Berlag series on the teak trees from Java. And you can see that in the graph. I think they, they have this record from 1514 to 1929 for the tree rings. And they use this as a proxy for the rainfall levels in Java throughout the different centuries. And you, what you can see in the graph is variation from the average. So what you can see is that from the 1620 or 1640s to 1660s, there was actually a very, 1643, 1671, there was a severe dry period in Java. And sort of it co coincides with this great drought from 1660 to 61, which was experienced in Borneo, Ambon, and the rest of Indonesia. And 1664 to 65 was supposedly the driest years. And supposedly it was also a time of the one of the worst, worst ep epidemics of the century. And the reason is that the drought led to the fact that they had no clean water. It led to crop failure. So it meant that way people were more prone to diseases because they were malnourished, because they were not eating well. And in general, people have said, you know, this longer dry season were, was evident in eastern Indonesia and the Philippines. And in, the, in this region, you had a very delicate balance between the wet and dry monsoons. And sort of these sort of weaker monsoons would sort of disrupt this whole pattern that you would see. And you have this one from Vietnam. This, this from... Victor Lieberman, in his work, he co-authored with a paleoclimatologist. And you can also see this from the three rings from a, from a tree in Viet, from a, from a tree in Vietnam. And so in this way, you, you could actually recreate what was happening during that time. The thinner the three ring, there would be a more severe type of drought. The other type of archive would be the archives of societies. And as a historian, or to a certain extent, this 
what I'm more familiar with, but at the same time, it's still different to a certain extent into how people use the archives when they're looking at, for example, the environment and the weather. And usually, whether the archives of the society, the written records, whether personal manuscript, official records, anything that has descriptions of weather patterns. In some cases, it could also be from the built environment. For example, high water marks, it would indicate where the flood was, the high point of a particular flood. If you look at this, this is one, the, the graph that you have there, this is from Robert Mark's book, the classic one on China and the and sort of the crisis that they had there. And it shows, you know, that from, there was a coincidence between the climate change and political disorders in the 17th century. There were more cold waves in the 17th century. In the graph, you had the number of counties reporting frost in the different gazetteers in China. So the logic was you had more cool waves, cooler temperatures. It meant shorter growing seasons, lower grain harvest yields. And this would lead to sort of this, this famine and sort of source and would affect the political disorders at that time. And I think this is the classic case and, you know, in the, of the use of the Chinese gazetteers. In the case of the Philippines, you have these cedularios. This is from Luis Derry. He has a book on the history of pestilence in the Philippines. And what he did was he looked at the cedulas found in the Philippine National Archives, and he pretty much looked through them through all of the centuries. And one of the common cedulas that he found was a lot of communities were asking for tribute exemptions. And usually when they complain, when they were petitioning the governor general asking for tribute exemptions, they would list the reasons why they could not pay the tribute, whether it was typhoons, droughts, flooding, locusts, for whatever reason, they would list it there. And this is how, and this is probably the most detailed sort of account we have of sort of the climatic history, or we don't know if it's related to climate, but it's, you can use it as a proxy to estimate the weather at that time, that there were droughts and locusts at that time. So for example, there were no crops to pay, that's why they would send the position to the governor general and they would ask exemptions or in some cases they would ask that the, they, they should be able to pay the tribute in species rather than in kind. And usually what this, what this in the appendix of Luis Derry's book, he compiled it all because he looked through all of the different cedulas in the National Archives. And usually this is what environmental historians studying the Philippines have been using to, to reconstruct historical weather in the Philippines. But of course, you know, you can see it also, this is just a snapshot of one of the, of the list. But if you look at the, the areas, it's mostly in Luzon. You have hardly any areas describing the Visayas and none in Mindanao. Because again, it's a highly uneven force. You're dependent with the Spanish uh, governor general. And I think they were much more reliant on the local population in the surrounding areas and provinces around Manila than in other areas. That's why you have more of this documentation about the, the Malay area in the Tagalog region. Just a, a last example of how archives of societies can be used to sort of reconstruct the weather in the 17th century. The last one is about the galleon voyages. This is a work by historians and I think some scientists. And what they did was they look at the different records of the different galleons that crossed the Pacific and they charted it. They tracked the end date at uh, the start date and the end date. So they knew how long it would take for the ships to cross the Pacific, whether from Manila to Acapulco or vice versa. And what they discovered was the galleon voyages took longer in the mid 17th century, 1600, first decade of 1600 and 1690 the average galleon voyage was 80 days, but from 1640 to 1670, it was around 120 days. That is from Acapulco to Manila. And it was the same thing on the return voyage from Manila to Acapulco. Usually the average was 160 days, but from in the middle of the 17th century, it increased to 200 days. So based on their theory, it was a reflection of the shift in the wind pattern during that time, that the wind, the monsoon was probably weaker. That's the reason why it took people a longer time to cross the Pacific in the middle of the 17th century. Because I think they tried to also look, well, maybe it had something to do with the route, the cargo, the ship design, but 
I think from what they've studied, they did some sort of modeling. And I think from their, they were able to factor it out that maybe it was actually trade winds and the positions of the Pacific monsoon that actually was the effect that caused these voyages to take longer than usual. And I think, you know, it's a very interesting use of archives that I personally would have not thought about that you could use these sort of galleon voyages to reconstruct the trade winds in the 17th century. But of course, there are certain limitations as well in a lot of these studies. It seems like there seems to be a stronger evidence for the impact of the Little Ice Age in Europe and in China. In Southeast Asia, there are still questions about it. I think the strongest proponent of this is Anthony Reed, but in, even then, even Anthony Reed would sometimes qualify his statements. And I think this is one of the problems as well with the idea of the Little Ice Age or the 17th century crisis. Most of the publications are on, nor on the Northern hem Hemisphere and the Temperate Zone. So it is possible that in some regions, the climate had an impact, but maybe it had a more this overall effect. And maybe you know, other parts of the world did not necessarily conform with the, what happened in Northern, Northwestern and Central Europe. And people in Southeast Asia, historians of Southeast Asia also pointed out the Little Ice Age is probably a misnomer for the region because in the tropical areas, the temperature was probably not that important. The cooling, the lower temperatures were much more prominent in the Northern Hemisphere rather than in regions closer to the equator. And also in some cases, some people have also said maybe the details in China, the political collapse in China the, is much more fits with the European data better than with Southeast Asia. And again, the, the re reasoning is that not all regions were in sync with each other. Maybe there were much more regional temperature anomalies rather than global ones. Because sometimes there's stronger correlations between what was happening in China and Vietnam rather than with Indonesia in terms of the weather. And even Anthony Reid, who's a proponent sort of the 17th century crisis in Southeast Asia, he also said, you know, that maybe the famines were not near the weather-induced famines in Southeast Asia were much more moderate than what you'd expect in India or China. But he also said that, you know, the population decline was very stronger. So in that sense, you know, it conformed with the pa global pattern of this population decline in the 17th century, mid-17th mid century. So, so in this case, you know, it's important also to look into the local circumstances. So even if you have a global context of lower temperature or rainfall, I think the low role of the historians to look at the specific local context and not to deduce from the general to the specific and balance it with local histories and the histories of specific communities. And I think there's some also what some of the difficulties, like where do you actually get these data to sort of balance, confirm if what was happening at the local level was would support or not or deny what was happening, what the general theory of a mid 17th century sort of crisis. In Southeast Asia, in the tropical regions, rather than temperature, historians have argued that rainfall precipitation was probably a much more important factor here. And again, whether the, the lower rainfall is related to the Little Ice Age or not, you can debate it. Because even in China, for example, the 1640s, the fall of the Ming Empire, Ming Dynasty, it was not necessarily cold, but there were drought related to the social upheaval of the 1640s. And but some people have argued that maybe one of the effects of the Little Ice Age in the tropics was reduced rainfall, reduced monsoon rains. At the very least, there has seems to be some correlation between the El Nino and the droughts. Although again, you know, the El Nino, it's always been there, whether in the 19th century, whether in the 17th century or not. But the logic was maybe we should be paying more attention to, to the El Nino, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and how they actually contributed to famines and drought. Because the logic is that typically during the El Nino, we have a weaker monsoon. So what you would have would be the reverse effect. You'd have heavy rains in the Americas and weak rains in Asia. And it seems like from in the middle of the 17th century, uh, you had the weakest Asian monsoons in the in the at that time. At least this for the Philippines. This from James Warren. He tried. He used the list from Luis Deris of the all of the events from the cedulas of the droughts and the locusts 
and he compared it with the with the El Nino events on the right. And in some cases, you'd see that maybe there was some correlation between the two. When there was an El Nino, there would be droughts. But in some cases, there was no perfect sort of coincidence between the two. But there seems to be, you know, when there's an El Nino, maybe there would be a drought in the area as well. But of course, you know, the coincidence is not enough. Not all... El Nino events produce droughts, and not all droughts are due to the El Nino or to the little ice age, to whatever it is. In some cases, uh, even when you talk about the El Nino phenomenon, in some cases, you have to be very specific in areas. In some cases, some cases in Southeast Asia were tied to these monsoons, and some of them were out of phase with these monsoons. So there was no really uniform reaction to these El Nino events. And again, it goes back to the idea that you might have these general regional weather climate or patterns, but you still need to look at the local circumstances on what is actually happening at the ground individual level. For example, Victor Lieberman, when he looked at the case of the of mainland Southeast Asia, his conclusion was, well, maybe for island Southeast Asia, you can argue that there was this little ice age that affected Java and the regions in Indonesia. Maybe this is one of the reasons why the Dutch were successful in conquering some of these areas because some of Makassar Matara might have been weakened by some of the droughts during that time. But Victor Lieber Lieberman's argument is maybe in mainland Southeast Asia, that was not the case because when he looked at the three rings from Vietnam and Thailand, what they concluded was it was actually a weather and the monsoons were actually improved in the middle of the 17th century rather than weaker. So. You have these sort of these nuances on maybe it's applicable in mainland Southeast Asia, not so much. It, I, not applic this idea of a crisis might be applicable in South Island Southeast Asia, but not so much in the mainland Southeast Asia. And this is one of the things as well. I think sometimes when you look at these. Especially, I remember when I look at, for example, uh, Jeffrey Parker's book, this thick book on the global crisis of the 17th century. And sometimes it had this list of all of these political collapses of, in, throughout Eurasia. And then you have a list of the, and then you have this background idea of the Little Ice Age. And sometimes it's all very, it's a survey approach. And I, I, I always wonder, you know, can you actually connect these things? Like, for example, you know, the Chinese revolting in Manila, can you actually related i haven't studied too much maybe other people are much more versed in this but for example you know was there any, any effect within the chinese in the philippines in manila when they were actually experiencing drought in china what would be the effect of this in terms of the diasporic communities throughout of the chinese diasporic communities throughout southeast asia during that time would there be more migration during this time of drought and chaos in in china this political collapse Maybe there was actually any relation between the two. In some cases, so if you look at the 1640s, it was a time of sort of abnormal droughts. You have this mega drought in China from 1637 to 1643. And then from historical records, we know that there were harvest failures in Indonesia, 1641 and 42, and the drought in, in the Philippines in the 16, early 1640s as well. And, but of course, you know, you had to specify in what particular places these actually happen to be able to, I think, to, to get more clarity in all of these cases. One thing, one interesting thing I've read on is that maybe you can look at the volcanic eruptions as well. For example, one of the reasons, for all, one of the, of course, you know, maybe there were a lot of factors contributing to drought conditions in the region. One of lower temperature, weaker monsoon, but the El Nino. But one of the theories is the volcanic eruptions because from 1630 to 1644, there were 12 known volcanic eruptions around the Pacific during that time. And the theory is the volcanic eruption would lead to sort of a short-term clim climatic change because they would create a dust field in the atmosphere and it would reduce the radiation and would result in cooling. So you have this account of a 
the explode eruption of Mount Parker in Mindanao in 1941. This is from a Spanish outpost in Zamboanga, a great darkness approaching from the south, which gradually extended over that entire hemisphere and blocked out the whole horizon. By 1 p.m., they were already in total night, and at 2 p.m., they were in such profound darkness that they could not see their own hands before their eyes. So this is what the account of what happened in 1641 in Mount Parker. And I read recently a bunch of scientists actually tried to relate the eruption, for example, of Mount Parker to what was happening in China at that time. And from their theory, from their climate modeling, they said, you know, the Ling, late Ming, Dyn Ming Dynasty mega drought from 1637 to 43, it actually started with a natural drought in 1637. But when Mount Parker in Mindanao exploded in 1641, it prolonged and intensified the, the, the drought that was going on in China. And their estimation was it probably extended the drought by three years because supposedly because of the dust veil, the cooling for two to three years, it weakened the East Asia summer monsoon, which led to the lack of rain and to the drought. Again, this is based largely on climate modeling of used by scientists. And sometimes there's also a difficulty when you see these climate modelings, how, how do you actually evaluate this as, as the historian? Just to let you know, five more minutes, please. Okay? Okay. But at the same time, there's also, and again, this is what makes it very difficult. At the same time, you have this, arg I read this article, it says, you know, based on climate modeling, uh, eruption would result in weaker summer monsoons, would result in drought and famine. But at the same time, some people would say, you know, the net impact of these volcanism during the mid during the 1640s is unclear because, you know, strong, it would actually lead to stronger monsoons. So as a historian, it's very difficult to intervene in these debates. I'm not a volcanologist or a meteorologist. So it's, you have many different variables at play. What is an effect of a volcanic eruption? Should it result in weaker monsoons and drought or not? So in some, some would say, you know, it would depend on the region as well. And at the very least, you know, when the art, when the article on the effect of the 1641 volcanic eruption that it worsened or lengthened the mega drought in China, it shows sort of the regional connections, the sort of connected history to a certain extent. Because for example, when volcanoes in Southeast Asia erupted, it sort of affected the whole globe. On the other hand, when volcanoes in the northern hemisphere erupted, usually the effect was much was much more local because I think because of the way air the the winds in the atmosphere work, the the closer the volcanoes are to the equator, the more widespread the dust would be spread out throughout the whole world. But at the same time, it's a curious thing as well, you know. This just some musings on possible connected histories. 1641, you have this Mount Parker eruption in Binanao, but at the same time, can you actually relate this with what was happening in Mindanao during that time? And in 1644, there seems to be a, a, some evidence that there was a drought and famine at that time, which may be related to the eruption of Mount Parker. But at the same time, if you look at the historiography in Maguindanao, it was actually it's actually remembered as a time of a golden age because during this time, it was a reign of Sultan Kudarat in the first half of the, 18th, of the 17th century. And if you look at accounts of his regime, of his sultanate, usually there's no mention of droughts or crises. And it's a bit ironic that you'd have such scientific articles arguing that the eruption in Mindanao would affect China and the famine there and the drought there. On the other hand, in Maguindanao, there's actually no mention of any sort of drought or crisis. It's actually remembered as a golden age. So, so this question then of maybe we should should we actually it's a connected history where whether we should actually incorporate Magandanao history to these regional global stories of crises. Are we missing something that maybe there was actually the golden age did have some problems or maybe they had much more resilient government or economies or maybe. <laughs> 
it's just a sort of a catastrophe that we completely missed. So I think this is also for environmental history. Maybe it's a common history of maybe in some cases, people experience the same climatic and environmental changes, but even then there, there might be some differentiated histories. And again, maybe it's up for debate whether there were hidden connections or maybe actual disconnections between the different regions. Maybe we can use, at least for, as a historian, maybe we can use the climatic history as guides to where to look at in terms of local histories, possible leads. Like if there's some volcanic eruption, how would this affect the local communities in the history of Maguindanao? So maybe it's a case of balancing the, the local sources with these sort of regional and global climate reconstructions in the mid 17th century of balancing what was happening with local communities and regional climates. And in environmental history, in some cases, they don't like the term disasters. Some environmental historians would prefer the, the term natural hazards because it's much more neutral. On the other hand, disasters, crises, it, there's a presumption of this is going to end in something negative. And maybe that's a more better way of looking at it in terms of maybe they experience the same drought, the same low temperatures, the low rainfall, but at the same time, people react, different communities reacted in different manners. You are muted. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, so as I said, we thank you very much, Mark, for this uh, very interesting uh, um, survey of what we can do with uh, climate, climatic history. And uh, now we will go on to our second uh, speaker this morning, Paulina Machuca from El Colegio de Michoacán. And she will talk to us about plants across the Pacific, sources for the history of circulation of American plants in East and Southeast Asia in the 16th and 18th, from the 16th to the 18th century. So I will give you the my position here and try to put your PPT PowerPoint here on, on here. Mm -hmm. But first you have to, I think you have to go back to Zoom. This is to go here. Compartir. Is it compartir? Good. Yeah. This is not. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this seminar for their kind invitation. As some of you may know, uh, for some years I have been working with the history of plant circulation during the first globalization, which has allowed me to publish some works as you can see on the slide. Um, oh, you can see them. Yeah. In the first work published in 2013, El Arribo de Plantas a las Indias Occidentales a través de las Relaciones Geográficas. I discuss how the introduction of European plants to the American continent produced significant changes in various domains, such as agriculture and food systems. And I focused on a biographic region called Balsas Jalisco, because it is a place of domestication of plants uh, since Mesoamerican times, and because it is a place of crossing of people and goods. It should be noted that in the period that I studied uh, here, um, which was the decade of the 1580s, just a few plants had crossed the Pacific with the Manila Galleon. Um, so we have to wait until the end of the 16th century to really see the arrival of plants and trees coming from the Philippines. Um, a year later, I published this article entitled The Arrival of American Plants in the Philippines, Ecological Colonialism in the 16th to 18th Centuries, 
in which I rather focused on the impact that uh, plants of American origin had in the Philippines. Um, and this work was published precisely in the Andaje de Historia de la I hope I pronounce it okay. <laughs> and more recently, I published the book El Vino de Cocos en la Nueva España, in which I analyzed the impact of the arrival of the coconut palm tree on the Mexican uh, Pacific coast from the second half of the uh, 16th century. Um, so, based on these experiences, I have noticed that the history of plants can be studied from a multidisciplinary approach. Broadly speaking, from ecology, ecology, we can observe changes in the landscapes. From agronomy, we can study the adoption of new cultivation techniques. From ethnobotany, we can analyze the selection of some plants um, over others. From economy and politics, we can identify the imposition of profitable crops. From anthropology, we can observe social cultural phenomena related to the practices and representations that are generated from the appropriation of these plants and so on. Um, another element to take into account is that the detailed study of the circulation of plants in the modern era is uh, complex because their circulation was not always recorded. However, it is possible to know the destiny of some plants of economic uh, interest for the different actors of the monarchy, such as spices, stimulants, giant plants, and some medicinal plants since they are registered in the list of boats that circulated across the ocean. So in this presentation, I will address uh, the different historical sources through which it is possible to trace the footprint of plants that cross the Pacific in both directions, such as the list of gallon merchandise, official and personal correspondence, and historical geographical chronicles. I will also mention the challenges faced by the historian when it comes to identifying the scientific names of these plants that are mentioned in archival documents. Um, I am not taking into account the information that can be obtained from European botanical gardens, since they mainly contain records from the second half of, this, of the 18th century. And that period is much better known and there are various publications. Um, on the matter. So I am going to show uh, some of the archives in which I have uh, found information concerning to, uh, to plants. El Archivo General de la Nación en México, in the Ramo Tierras um, of this archive, we can find interesting information about the cultivation of plants of Asian origin especially the Mexican, uh, in the Mexican Pacific coast, such as coconut, rice, tamarind. This document on the slide, uh, for example, is really interesting because it contains information about the creation of a neighborhood of Chino, a neighborhood of, well, they were called Chinos in New Spain. Um, and this neighborhood was created in Coyuca, near Acapulco. And their work on rice plantation is, is explained. Um, the difficulty is that this kind of information concerning uh, plants is um, somewhat hidden among a lot of other uh, data. That is to say, there is no special collection of documents dedicated to the transportation of plants rather than the historian must look for a needle in a haystack. Likewise, in the inventories of the galleons, there are lists of plants with medicinal uses, although many of them are not live plants, but processed into ointments or oils or bone. Um, in the Archivo General de la Nación in Mexico City, we can also find official letters, such as uh, that one that Viceroy Almanza wrote to the king in 1573, 
in which he informs that the tamarind coming from the Philippines had been transplanted simultaneously to Acapulco and Cuernavaca. And he mentions that the tamarind, um, as you can see on the slide, uh, the tamarind wants very hot and humid land and some irrigation. It seems that the winds from the sea post uh, help it. So this is a route from um, the road from Acapulco to Mexico City. And on the road, there is Cuernavaca. Cuernavaca is well known because there was a garden of um, acclimatization plants coming from Asia. Um, there is also the uh, Archivo Historico del Municipio de Colima. This archive is perhaps the richest in information on the use and management of the coconut palm by the Indios Chinos or Chinese. Justice documents from the late 16th century and through the 17th century can be found here, reporting on the various uses of coconuts, uh, of coconut tree as food, drink, medicine, architecture. We can also find uh, some maps like these ones that illustrate the changes in the landscape from the uh, eruption of the palm tree. Uh, in the Archivo Historico del Municipio de Colima, we can also find uh, signatures in Baibajin, which is the ancient um, scripture of the Filipino people. And this is an example. And this is a justice document that um, explains that Indios Chinos were um, doing a beverage, a distilled beverage, an, an alcoholic beverage. Then we have the, um, um, okay, no, no, I'm going back. So I was telling you that the Archivo Historico del Municipio de Colima also contains information regarding to these Indios Chinos and their commercial activity. Here, it is possible to find clues concerning changing of landscapes in the Puerto de la Navidad, Puerto de la Navidad, well, this is Colima, Puerto de la Navidad is just here. Uh, changing in the landscapes in, in this area as a consequence of the contact with the Philippines. The Port of La Navidad, along with the port with Salawa, Salawa today, Manzanillo, were places where sick people from the galleon disembarked. There are also documents regarding to the production of coconut wine, which is called Lambanoc in the Philippines, which was a drink introduced by the Filipinos uh, at the end of the 16th century. Okay. We have also the um, the Archivo de la Casa de Morelos. Uh, first, the Archivo de la Real Audiencia de Nueva Galicia, but then the Archivo de la Casa de Morelos, located in Michoacán, the capital Morelia, Archivo Histórico Municipal de Morelia, Archivo Histórico Municipal de Pátzcuaro. So here we have the Archivo de la Real Audiencia in Guadalajara and um, then in Michoacan. As you can see, these archives are situated on the Pacific coast where the Filipinos were settled. So here in these archives, we can find uh, data on the planting of rice, tamarinds, mango, coconut, by, and rice by some Filipinos. And once again, the production of lambano or vino de cocos. And the same information can be uh, found in these articles. Um, here on the Mexican Pacific Strip, many, um, many Asian plants were acclimatized um, as a consequence of um, the galleon trade. In the well, the Archivo General de India, in Seville. Here we can find a wide variety of materials that inform us about the circulation of plants um, from letters, royal decrees, records of the Real Caja de Acapulco, etc. Chronicles by authorities and missionaries in the archipelago and adjacent islands devote many pages to reporting the region's enormous vegetable richness 
and the benefits that some plants and trees could bring to the empire. <laughs> One relevant document is found here, and is a letter by Juan Bautista Roman, Royal Factor of the Philippines, who proposed projects to transplant Filipino spices in Spain, um, in Spanish America possessions, to save the crown, uh, the economic and human cost of shipping them from Asia to Europe. So in this letter addressed to the King Philip II on June uh, 1584, Bautista Roman suggested transplanting Asian paper in America, as you can write, as you can read here. Your Majesty would combine exploitation in India with that of the West Indies, thus reducing the expenses incurred in ships, mouths, or ordinary place. Also, the Indies are closer to European roads and would entail little or no cost to carry paper to Spain, especially from the islands called Barlovento in the Caribbean region where it could be planted like ginger that Will de la Besares should work. He's talking about um, paper. So we can find some letters like this one, which are really interesting in information about the projects at that time. So um, going more quickly. Roman's dynamic uh, perspective, interpre and entrepreneurial spirit was nothing new. In a sense, it echoed Guido de la Besares' model. Guido de la Besares, uh, he was a man credited with the, uh, for introducing ginger to America. So there is another letter, which is not here, but that letter from Guido de la Besares, uh, he writes that in Cebu in 1569, the letter states that he shipped tamarind trees uh, and ginger on a boat called San Juan that left Cebu in 1569 for Acapulco. And Guido de la Besares uh, sent those plants, uh, in quotes, to be planted in the most fertile provinces of New Spain. I sent this ship some pepper seedlings from the same purpose. So this is, um, this is what Guido de la Besares took, the ginger and the tamarindo. I like to mention that in the year 2019, there was an exposition in the Archivo General de Indias of many of the documents regarding to spices in Asian plants uh, that traveled during the first globalization. As a result, there uh, was um, this catalog um, by my colleague Antonio Sanchez de Mora entitled Flavors That Sell um, flavors that sail across the seas. This is a very complete catalog of the kind of sources that we can find in the Archivo General de Indias concerning to Asian plants and products. We have, of course, the Biblioteca Nacional de España uh, in Madrid. In the Biblioteca, there is a very valuable material on the geographical relations of the 18th century which has not yet been extensively worked on. It is a series of descriptions from the second half of the 18th century that tells us about the acclimatization of dozens of plants of Asian origins in New Spain. I have in my hands the microfilms of those Relaciones Geográficas, this is an example, uh, waiting to have time to possess the whole information of nearly a hundred of uh, those Relaciones Geográficas. I want to say that these Relaciones Geográficas are different from these ones, which I'm going to, uh, to mention. So this is the Relaciones Geográficas of the 16th century. This is a different series. This is from the 18th century and this is from the 15th century. Fortunately, these Relaciones Geográficas corresponding to New Spain have been transcribed and published by René Acuña in the 1980s. It is an invaluable source for knowing which plants of European and Asian origin had been introduced. The only disadvantage of these Relaciones uh, is that they were elaborated between 1570s and 1580s, when Trans-Pacific voyages were just beginning. So this phenomenon of the introduction of plants originating from Asia continent has not been really fully recorded here. 
uh, other archives that I have visited and I have found some kind of information is our uh, Archivo Franciscano Ibero Oriental in Madrid. I have not been here yet. Uh, Archivo Provincial de los Dominicos en Ávila. Uh, I have been to the Archivo Histórico de la Compañía de Jesús in Catalunya. This is in Barcelona. This is a really rich archive. El Archivo del Museo Oriental de los Padres Agustinos de Valladolid la Real Academia de la Historia de Madrid o la Biblioteca eh, Real de Madrid. Here, for example, we can find the work by Ignacio Alcina, 1668. So I'm going a little bit faster. So we have uh, other sources like this one from Cristóbal de Acosta, Tratado de las Drogas y Medicinas de las Indias Orientales. It is one of the earliest works, uh, works describing many of the plants of the East Indies. Um, and this book was written a few years after the publication of García de Horta's great work, which I will refer later. What it is interesting in this uh, book is the inclusion of the pineapple, the Cristobal de Acosta, within a list of Asian plants. As we know, the pineapple is native to the Amazon region in America and was brought to the Asian continent by the Portuguese and by the Spanish. So in this description, Acosta recognizes that pineapple is native to Brazil and that in the East Indies, uh, there were plenty of them uh, everywhere. So we have, we have uh, plants from Asian origin, but also from American origin in the same book. We also have the, the book by Fray Blas de la Madre de Dios, Libro de las Medicinas Caseras, Para Consuelo de los Religiosos y Alivio de los Enfermos. And this is, um, this is part of a series of medicinal book um, in which uh, he mentions how some medicinal plants coming from Mexico were used in the pharmacopoeia in the Philippine archipelago at the beginning of the 16th century. 17th century, sorry, such as the achiote, which was being used for burns and other skin um, conditions. This is the achiote. This is really, really Mexican. Um, also, the, the name achiote is Nahuatl. It's called achiote in the Philippines. So it was being used in the pharmacopoeia in the archipelago. Let me stop for a moment in this plant. Um, it is a very interesting case because the Chiote traveled from Mexico to the Philippines in early times. Today, the Chiote is used in various dishes uh, from the islands, such as um, there is a dish called carecare -care in the Philippines. And in the Philippines, the Chiote is sold as dried seeds, as paste or powder. Uh, the achiote served in the archipelago as a substitute for saffron or saffron for the Spanish that established in the, in the Philippines. It must be remembered that the saffron or the saffron was used by Spanish sailors, not only as a spice, but also as a medicine. It is called achiote in the Philippines and also anato, and also was adopted by the Chinese population who use the achiote in sauces for noodles, as in a dish called pansi palabok. I don't have time to address to many other plants like the achiote that, may, that had many uses as condiments, as medicinal, uh, that were adopted very soon on the other side of the Pacific. So we have the uh, libro de Ignacio Mercado, libro de las medicinas, de esta tierra y declaraciones de las virtudes de los árboles y plantas, the Augustinian Ignacio Mercado, uh, by the way, Ignacio Mercado was born in the Philippines. So he wrote in 1685 this book, and in the same way, we observe that um, there is a full incorporation of American plants in the Philippine pharmacopoeia, mm -hmm. and here um, various uses of chili mixed with local plants stand out. The work of Mercado, um, as well as the illustrations that are not here, but there are many illustrations in this book, are observed in the Archivo, uh, are conserved in the Archivo de los Agustinos in Valladolid in Spain. And some other religious archives, uh, well, I have mentioned some of them, like the Franc Franciscans, los Franciscanos in Madrid, the Dominicans in, in Avila, for example. 
They should be very useful for tracing the transfer of plants and agricultural and nutritional techniques through the missionaries who pass from Spain to New Spain and then to the Philippines. We have this, um, this is this work by George Joseph Camel. So in the British Library, we can find the correspondence of the Jesuit uh, George Joseph Camel with European scholars. Camel has been studied by my colleague, Sebastian Krupa, who analyzes the exchange of knowledge and materials with uh, figures in the Indies and Europe. Joseph Camel um, communicated with Dutch botanists in Batavia, but also with English surgeons in Madras. And he also communicated with two members of the Royal Society in London, the apothecary James Bettiver and the naturalist John Ray. So my colleague uh, Sebastian Krupa um, analyzed the letters and the creation of a long distance uh, network of knowledge exchange. Francisco Blanco published in 1837, The Flora de Filipinas, and it is a book of 887 pages that contain uh, information of hundreds of Philippine plants, I quote Philippine plants, because many of them are really American plants or, or, or plants of American origin, such as um, cacao, papaya, um, anil, many, many plants. For example, there is an interesting description of uh, cacao, the Obrama cacao, in which he mentions the first introduction of this plant uh, to the archipelago. As we can read here, uh, he says, this little tree is native to America. In the year 1670, the pilot named Pedro Bravo Lagunas brought a cacao tree from Acapulco in a pot. He gave it to his brother, a clergyman from Camarines named Bartolome Bravo. This was stolen by an Indian native of Lipa named Juan de Laguila, who hid and benefited. And it was from this cacao tree that abundance, that the abundance of this island originated. So this is a rare example of a detailed account of how a plant was transported and then disseminated in the archipelago. There are um, and other interesting elements in Blanco's work. For example, when he refers to capsicum, capsicum is Chile, Chile. So when he refers to uh, capsicum, um, he says that it is indigenous to the island. So he says that Chile is indigenous to the Philippines. Uh, I quote, this plant grows anywhere and is indigenous to the islands. We know that Chile is obviously from Mexico. But it is, um, it is up to a certain common type that there, um, there are this type of errors or mistakes uh, in some chronicles and descriptions. So historians must be very alert and we don't have to repeat the same uh, mistakes. When talking about the sources of circulation of plants, we must refer to other works by Portuguese, English, and Dutch. I just chose some examples like uh, Garcia da Horta, Colloquios de Cipres eh, Droga. So Garcia da Horta's work is uh, a pioneer in the record of Asian plants that are, um, are made known to an European public. This work circulated in some sectors of the Hispanic monarchy. And for this reason, many of the references that we have in New Spain of Asian plants resources um, are due to Garcia de Horta's work, who is even referred by Francisco Hernández, author of the Historia Natural de Nueva España. Another, uh, this is a Portuguese source. Another example is um, this, A New Voyage Around the World by William Dampier. We all ha also have many chronicles by pirates, I quote pirates, and travelers in general who describe the places they visited. For example, thanks to William Dampier, we know about tobacco production in the island of Mindanao. Within a few decades of, decades of its arrival from Mexico, tobacco had become an important, um, had become important even in areas beyond the Spanish crown 
dominion, especially in Muslim Mindanao. It is noteworthy that during his travels to Mindanao in 1686, five minutes, okay, William Dampier observed the importance of tobacco production here, not only for internal consumption, but also for trade with the Dutch, who traveled from Terrenate and Tidor to obtain it. Upon comparing tobacco from Mindanao and Manila, um, William Dampier noted that the former was darker in color and had longer leaves, while the leaves of vanilla tobacco were yellowish and less resistant. So I'm going more quickly. We have another example. Mm. There is the historical relation of the island of Ceylon in the East Indies by Captain Robert Knox. Um, this, this work, this book was produced and published thanks to the collaboration with the author, collaboration of the author with other scholars, including Robert Hook. And this uh, publication received financial support from the members of the East India Company. As Anna Winterbottom highlights, this relation, um, I quote, should be seen in the context of a number of texts collected, translated, or commissioned by the East India Company in cooperation with the Royal Society during the late 17th century. That informed and shaped both European expansion and natural philosophy. So Anna Winterbottom mentions that this relation was used as the basis for bioprospecting for naturally occurring drugs and for food sources um, in efforts at agricultural transplant transplantation spanning in the Indian and Atlantic oceans. The chapters four and five of these relations are uh, dedicated to fruits, trees, herbs, and flowers in the island. And among them, we can find uh, corn and pumpkins from the American continent. Uh, there is also relevant information about the circulation of American plants in Chinese sources from the 17th and 18th centuries. However, some of these works are not translated yet. So we need the expertise of Chinese speaking scholars like many of you. I will refer to an interesting work published recently by my colleague Angela Schottenhammer about the use of Peruvian balsam in China and Japan. So the Peruvian balsam is a botanical balsam that has a long history of medicinal use, particularly as antiseptic and for wound healing. Schottenhammer mentions that other, other than silver, medicinals were some of those products imported to Japan and China. And I quote from her, medicinal knowledge definitely belonged to the kind of information that sometimes crossed oceans, perhaps accidentally, but that could revolutionize health systems in other countries. So here are some examples of the sources that Angela where Angela got this information. Um, I will finish this presentation with a database I am doing now from Ignacio Alcina's work from his Historia Natural de los Indios Visayas published in 1668. This is a very a rich source of information regarding to plants in the archipelago. So thanks to Alcina, we can know about European plants in the Philippines, American plants in the Philippines, but also plants, com plants coming from China, Makassar, and the Moluccas. There is, uh, the interesting thing about Alcina's book is that it provides us some details uh, of the use of some plants by the Chinese established in the sur surroundings of um, Manila. Maybe you cannot see, but uh, for example, he says that the anise is coming uh, to the Philippines from China and from Spain. And then he, he worked, he, he says, for example, that the agonoi was a medicinal plant. And he said that the Spanish took this herb uh, from, the, from El Maluco, where there were uh, great, um, there were great, there was great uh, medicinal knowledge there. So, um, of course, there is a bibliography. Uh, bibliography is a valuable source 
Uh, for example, there is uh, the work of my colleague here, Teresa Nobre de Caraballo, who has worked with the plants in the expedition or account of Antonio Pigafetta. We have these kind of books in Busqueda de las Especias, uh, the plants from the Magallanes Elcano expedition, and many, many other examples. So my final remarks are that those of us who work on the issue of plant circulation need to cross reference information from archives and bibliography. It seems to me that Spanish sources should draw more from the Chinese, Portuguese, Dutch, English, and French sources in order to have a more complete vision of the biological and biocultural interactions that developed in that part of, um, of Asia. And I will finish here. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, Paulina. Um, if I read the program well, we are now called to a coffee break. And uh, so, I mean, that's what's in the program, but we can also go on to the third presentation if you prefer. Would you, would you like to go on to the, what? Either we discuss, either we go to the third presentation, either we have a coffee break, whatever. But right now on the program, it's coffee break. And then we have the third presentation and then the, the, the discussion. So I don't know how you want to go about. Do you want to change things? Do you want to? No, but I mean, uh, some people seem to say we should go on. Some others. Eleven coffee break, eleven thirty Miguel, and then discussion and then presentation of the book. That's the program. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Guillaume. <laughs> okay, so we'll we'll stop for half an hour, uh, have a coffee break, and then uh, uh, meet again at eleven thirty. Okay, for twenty five minutes. Okay. Bye bye. See you soon. No, just, oh, you want to say something? No, 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 no. no. no just, uh,
Okay. Hello, everyone. We are back a bit late. Sorry for the few minutes of delay. We are going to uh, now hear our third speaker for the morning, uh, Miguel Rodriguez Lorenzo from CHAP. And he will talk to us about the inquisitorial sources for the history of maritime East and Southeast Asia uses and possibilities. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so as the title of the presentation says, I will be focusing on inquisitorial sources, um, which um, have been mainly used, or uh, there is quite the, the, a large audience of usage of inquisitorial sources for the context uh, of the Iberian Peninsula, of, of the Atlantic world, and also um, of the American continent. Um, and you, you probably have realized that there is quite a smaller audience that deals in, source, in, in inquisitorial sources uh, pertaining to the Asian world. So um, I will be focusing on that. Um, inquisitorial sources uh, have repeatedly been used to delve into past societies' everyday practices, social attitudes, and mindsets, providing segmented views into social hierarchies, cultural exchanges, religious beliefs, or instances of belonging in exercises in micro history. I don't think is this being shared yet? No, no not yet. Um, so. <clears throat> Alongside these so usually so-called case studies, you will find broader scoped analysis, usually associated with research into Judaism as a religious offense, that draw on the connected nature of those groups who came to be tried on such grounds. This latter analysis often focuses on family or mercantile networks and on trans-regional, transcontinental, or transoceanic exchanges of commodities. These very broadly stroked approaches to inquisitorial sources with a major emphasis on the trial records focused have heavily on European and uh, Ibero-American societies. In recent years, however, inquisitorial sources have been increasingly used by historians working on the Western Pacific seas, especially those focusing on the Philippines. Therefore, there is a clear recognition of the usefulness of such documents for writing the history of Southeast and East Asia, at least from, a, from the perspective of colonial or Iberian relations. The question, it seems, is how, as the title of this workshop suggests, may inquisitorial sources be used uh, to, to, for writing a common history of Southeast and East Asia? Scholarship of the last 20 years has shown that the two inquisitorial tribunals that had jurisdiction over the Western Pacific Seas, those of Goa and Mexico, maintained a solid network of representatives in Southeast and East Asia, as displayed in the, image, uh, uh, that, in the images that you can see uh, uh, on the screen. The Goa Tribunal nominated commissarios for locations such as Malacca, Ternate, Solor, Timor, Makassar, Ayutthaya, Macau, and even if only nominally, Japan, while its counterpart in Mexico did the same for most of the locations in the Philippines where the Spaniards had ciudades, villas, and presidios, uh, as well as several provinces uh, of the archipelago. It did the same beyond the confines of this specific group of islands, nominating furthermore commissarios for Taiwan, also the Marianas, which falls beyond the scape of this paper, but also for Ternate after Portuguese ecclesiastical authorities were expelled from the territory by Sebastián Hurtado de Corcuera in the 1640s. This tight network of commissioners of the Holy Office produced an abundant amount of documents in the form of questionnaires, denunciations, or correspondence regularly sent 
um, to the tribunal's headquarters in Goa or Mexico. Both tribunals, therefore, became repositories of information on Ibero-Asian Ibero societies in the Western Pacific Seas and of their Zitz in Leben of the maritime world of Southeast and East Asia. However, looking at inquisitorial sources, a number of issues could be raised to challenge that could, they could be of service to a history of Southeast Asia and East Asia beyond the strict Iberian slash colonial approach. The nature of the trials and of the defendants involved in inquisitorial proceedings could be numbered among those issues, for instance. The fact that Iberian inquisitions carried out trials against Christian individuals for their religious offenses against the Catholic faith means that whatever the aspects of the social, religious, or mercantile life mentioned in such documents were forcefully addressed in connection with Catholicism, thus leaving aside a significant universe of individuals and realities from these sources. So the question some of you uh, not necessarily working on Iberian agents in Asia might pose really is, why should I care about inquisitorial sources? Another objection to the possibilities of a wider usage of inquisitorial sources is the known fact, especially for those most familiar with the Spanish Inquisition, that its courts in America were pre precluded from trying indios, a broad category that designated local populations. Again, this would imply that baptized Asian individuals would never be scrutinized by the, by the tribunal vis-a-vis -vis non Catholic beliefs and ritual expressions, thus limiting the scope of the information to be acquired from such sources beyond the Iberian side of Ibero Asian societies. I would like to address these two issues before moving forward. On the one hand, inquisitorial practice was not incompatible with conducting trials against non-Christian individuals. As a matter of practice, non-Christian individuals were considerable liable to undertake an inquisitorial trial whenever their actions proved to be detrimental to Christianity. This resulted in dozens of so-called Gentiles by inquisitorial authorities and of Muslims to be tried by the Holy Office uh, at Goa, for instance. Therefore, inquisitorial sources were quite privy to the worlds beyond Christianity, even if the enactment of uh, its procedure forcefully involved Catholicism. On the other hand, although the Spanish Inquisition in the American continent was precluded from trying baptized local populations, the Portuguese Inquisition was not. Information pertaining to the going Inquisition's activity reveals an abundant, uh, an overabundance of individuals born in Asia with no European ancestry subjected to inquisitorial trials. And even though that was not the case for the Philippines, this limited institutional framework did not prevent individuals from addressing the problems arising thereof. As such, both sides of the Iberian Inquisitions in the Western Pacific Seas collected information on non-Christian societies according to their, to their institutional frameworks. However, the archival legacy of that uh, documentary production is sadly unequal as extant information produced in the Philippines is quite larger than the one produced in other locations where Portuguese commissioners of the Holy Office resided due to the destruction of the Go Inquisition's records in the 19th century. There is a de facto limitation on quantitative information that can be gathered on non-Christian societies or non-Christian communities in Ibero-Asian societies. However, as I mentioned, such information is available and can be traced. The most blatant example is that of uh, Chinese processions, as they are mentioned in inquisitorial documents. Both Portuguese and Spaniards made their uneasiness on Chinese festive events known to the commissioners of the Holy Office in their respective locations. For instance, the presence of non-Christian Chinese in the Parian was always a matter 
uh, that left inquisitorial authorities uh, uh, in Manila uncomfortable ever since the late 16th century, after the commissioner had been established in the archipelago. The fact that the Inquisition at Mexico was precluded from trying the naturales did not deter some individuals from expressing their opinion on the harmful effects of the processions that occurred during the Lunar New Year for both Christianized Chinese and the Spaniards living at Manila, both of which attended such festivities. In 1652, Portuguese Jesuit Francisco Velho was precisely one such person who manifested his objections before the inquisitors in Mexico, providing short descriptions of the processions uh, and um, of the idols that took part uh, in them and also providing their names. Curiously enough, something similar happened in Macau. As is known, in the second half of the 17th century, or to phrase it differently, in Qing rule China, Macau experienced quite the precarious existence, its city officials complaining on the creation of a customs house and on the heavy toll exacted by Qing officials. Nevertheless, testimonies on Chinese ceremonies in Macau were produced before the commissioners of the Holy Office there, which were sent to the inquisitors at Goa and thence to the general council of the Holy Office in Lisbon, which is the only, only reason why they are known today. These testimonies refer to, and I quote, a naval solemnity. So either a very early reference to the naval uh, ceremonies, uh, uh, which are known today as the, the Dragon Boat Festival uh, in Macau, or a, a form of naval profession, procession associated with the Ama Temple uh, in Macau, the Temple da Barra in Portuguese. It also provides information on the realization of quote unquote Chinese processions inside the city, but by this meaning the location where the Portuguese resided in Macau, in connection with the erection of a new temple in the Macau Peninsula, thus providing chronological reference hitherto unused by scholarship to uh, map Chinese um, uh, ritual expressions and temple erections in Macau. And these were not the only instances where the Holy Office was at the receiving end of information concerning the Chinese. In fact, the Inquisition was one of the lesser known participants in the allegations that from time to time were produced in the Philippines uh, on the conveniences of expelling the Chinese from the archipelago. Granted, the Inquisition was not the most active of actors in this discussion, but the fact that one audiencia official went out of its way to send uh, a discurso um, uh, to the Consejo de la Suprema in 1677 suggests its documentary holdings may reveal yet further information, albeit through uh, the Spanish administrative filter. The Inquisition records are also a significant source to correlate with other Spanish sources and uh, uh, also Chinese ones in order to determine uh, preferential, preferential commercial uh, relations with some individuals in the archipelago. For instance, in the wake of the procedures against the Portuguese new Christian Duke Fernando Vitória in 1597, in his day possibly the wealthiest of the Portuguese residing in Manila, during the complex process of determining which assets were to be confiscated uh, by the Holy Office and which were not, uh, several sangleas are mentioned. And in Spanish pronunciation, uh, Kingo Suican, Alonso Saguyo, this one uh, definitely uh, uh, sang, uh, Christian Sangle. These are names that appear quite often in the procedures. They were obviously quite relevant for Vitoria, but how relevant were they to the overall Manila Fujian uh, trade? <clears throat> Does the importance of this new Christian match the importance of his Chinese associates? Contrary to the practice in some inquisitorial studies, I do not believe inquisitorial sources provide all the answers. We do need to look elsewhere to find them. While inquisitorial sources will provide qualitative information on the non 
uh, Christian world of Southeast and East Asia, it is undeniable that most of the information will pertain to the Catholic world in the region. However, I do not wish to spend the final part of this presentation focusing on the European side on this Catholic, uh, of these Catholic societies, but rather on some of its communities that sometimes do not produce enough documentation for us to determine their social practices or expectations. Japanese Christians provide the most interesting of examples. Japanese Christians went out, uh, went through the trouble of producing accusations before the commissaries of the Holy Office in Manila against new Christians, which they suspected to be Jude Judaizers. Their denunciations revealed they shared some of the commonplaces that circulated in Manila in the late 16th century against new Christians, namely that they were Jews that fled to the Philippines in order to escape uh, prosecution from the going position. Testimonies sent to Manila from Nagasaki, for instance, where the number of Japanese uh, Christians was, was quite high, indicate that children on the street knew what a Jew was, understood it to be a bad thing, joked about it, and laughed at those rumored to be so. This means that Japanese Christians, owing to the conviviality with the Portuguese and education in a Catholic Portuguese culture, were incorporating anti-Jewish anti stereotypes and prejudices. And while I'm on the topic of Japanese Christians, let me just say that inquisitorial sources also provide information uh, on those who had been expelled from Japan owing to Tokugawa hostility towards Catholicism. For instance, the testification of Japanese women before commissioners of the Holy Office in Macau reveal self-perceptions, self-representations, and external perceptions of their qualities as Catholics by other elements of uh, Macau society, thus providing rare information that combined with other sources should contribute to flesh out profiles of newly baptized communities in Asia. The Armenian trading community was another such communities that was also present in Southeast and East Asia, albeit not necessarily a Catholic one, or at least not always. Francisco de los uh, Angeles, a Filipino scholar, in his now classical study of 1981, identified no less than 24 Armenian individuals that settled in the Philippines between the 1730s and the early 19th century, having at some point in time been questioned by the commissioners of the Holy Office there. While some of the interrogation focused on matters of doctrine, especially Armenian rejection, of the Council of Chalcedon of uh, 451, uh, these documents potentially provide information on the sociability of this community in the Philippines and their networks of solidarity stretching from uh, West Asia and Persia to Southeast Asia. In this regard, extant documentation from the Go Inquisition may also be of interest, as can be appreciated from the trial of Father Juan de Matus, a Macau-born secular priest uh, who descended from an Armenian father and a Chinese woman. Detained by the Go Inquisition on charges of sodomy in 1633, his ancestry points to a presence of Armenian Catholics in Macau. His father was also called Juan de Matus, uh, well before the Holy Office in Manila started to take notice of uh, the presence of this community. As I have been trying to emphasize, inquisitorial sources are useful tools to further our knowledge on the history of migrations in this part of the globe. The case of the natives of Ternate, who started arriving in more consistent waves to the Philippines since the expedition of Pedro Bravo de Acuña that retook the old Portuguese fortress in the Malucas in 1606, provides yet another fine example of this. A denunciation produced before the commissioner of the Holy Office in Manila in 1651 refers to one Doña Luisa de Mata, who, resort, who resorted to, and I quote, some Ternatan Indias to ask for herbs or spells to attract men, something that occurred more than once and also with different Indias. And hers was not by any means the only case. And if I may be permitted to speak of one last migrant community, I would like to refer to the Portuguese in the Philippines. 
Diverse scholars have resorted to inquisitorial sources to identify Portuguese presence in Manila after the 1580s. Francisco de los Angeles, Eva Ushmani, Lucio de Souza, aside from myself, have resorted to trials, denunciations, questionnaires to highlight a specific profile of Portuguese there. Male, trader, new Christian, accused of Judaizing, mainly between the 1580s and 1640s. However, these same sources, if scrutinized carefully, are used to expand the profile, uh, are useful, sorry, to expand the profile of the Portuguese resident in Manila beyond this narrow scope. A survey of the most known sources to study cases of Judaism in the Philippines reveals an abundance of Portuguese who are not necessarily new Christian. In fact, they may very well be old Christian who migrated to the archipelago and occupied uh, uh, other types of labor, not necessarily trade, like soldiers, sailors, pilots, or estancieros. While the usual sources for studying Judaism in the Philippines will certainly provide further data on the Portuguese community at large there, another promising prospect of research lies beyond this chronology and the cases of Judaism themselves. Questionnaires conducted by the commissioners of the Holy Office in Manila point to the city maintaining a Portuguese community even after the Portuguese crown broke from the Habsburg monarchy. In many instances, we can link individuals testifying in the 1640s and the 1650s to prominent members of the training community in Malacca. Genealogy reports on agents of the Holy Office born in Manila indicate that one of them even shared at least some Portuguese ancestry. Surnames too are quite reminiscent of Portuguese origin in these sources, although those are not reliable criteria uh, in my opinion. And well, only deeper inquiries into uh, these documents may reveal the extent to which individuals recognized or, um, or identifying themselves as Portuguese remained in Manila as the decades went by. And I will end with the final example of how inquisitorial sources can be unexpectedly useful to reveal uh, unusual or at least not so frequently recorded types of mobilities, namely those beyond Iberian controlled locations. Such is the case of this Portuguese man married to a woman in Macau and to another one in Han Anhai in Fujian reported by none other than Vittorio Riccio, who managed to find time to conduct a formal inquiry in Taiwan uh, to present to the inquisitorial authorities in Manila in the midst of the whole 1662 Koxinga affair. An inquiry means that he had to find Catholics there who could testify on the gospels, so in a non-Catholic territory in the tense environment in the early 1660s. And he did. So, um, I hope that from these examples, you might find opportunities to look to inquisitorial sources with another eye, another eye even if I realize that you won't make them your preferential sources, but of course. But thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. So, now, so now we are, uh, um, we have about half an hour, to say, for discussion. So uh, actually the floor is open to questions. Anyone, if you have questions online, please raise your hand uh, if you can on the, on the, on the Zoom uh, application. And here in the, in the room, please just raise your hand. Yes, first question. You? Yes, thank you. Um, it's for Paulina and Mark. It is about uh, archaeological um, sources. If we have things that can be more information in Philippines. Yeah. Um, I think it's more Lately, there has been a great advance in techniques of. Uh, how do we say Ar archaeometry, archaeometry, yeah. and this is very helpful because from there you can find the problem in, in, in some part of 
a building or something. And you can you can trace the rest of plants by, by the analysis in a laboratory. But also what Mark uh, said about the the rings of the trees, mm -hmm. which is which is really useful uh, for us. I don't know if Mark knows if this kind of uh, research has been done for the village, um, but it would be very very useful. I also have a question for Mark. Maybe 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 later. Okay, Mark, would you like to? Answer a bit to um, Guillaume's question, or do you have anything you want to say? Mark, you can perhaps hear us. Okay. Oh, yes, there you are. I was having difficulty turning my camera on. <laughs> right, right, go ahead. I think in the archaeological sources, uh, sometimes, can you hear me or see? Yes, yes yeah. no problem. I think in the archaeological sources, I think a lot of the techniques, like for example, that would work in the temperate regions, uh, don't work in 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 a tropical climate. So I think, I at least that's my impression. Like a lot of the archaeology is much more, I don't know, it's it's less intensive than what you'd find in other areas of the world, especially in Europe. I think, and going to Paulina's remark, I think. In the past decade or so, I think there was there's an archaeologist in the University of the Philippines. I think they did they tried to look for trees in the Philippines. And I think they did because I think in these cases they tried to sample different trees, different locations. Is it better if you get trees from on top of a mountain near a river? So it was a clear experimentation very, very early. And I think they did they were able to find do it, but I think. It was only for 50 or 100 years. So it's not going to stretch all the way back to the 17th century. So I think it's a, it's a, it's not that easy. And I like what I mentioned earlier. I think when the seasonality is much more pronounced, like in the Northern Hemisphere, I think the tree rings are much more prominent as well. On the other hand, if you have wet and dry season, supposedly the tree rings are not as, as visible as well. So I think there are certain limitation it, it i think it requires different strategies as well but again you know i'm not an archaeologist <laughs> okay so we have another two questions in the room so maybe yes yeah. oh maybe come closer to the to, because i think the microphone is right here so yeah, it will make it easier to paulina and uh, another one to, to miguel to paulina um uh, your most interesting overview uh, reminded me of a book we talked about during the break, edited by by Bartolome Yun on American globalization, in which he makes a claim. He and the other contributors to the book make the claim that, um, although the, of course the the, the whole uh, circulation of plants, the process of envi environmental change as a result of European colonization was very disruptive and destructive both in social terms and environmental terms. They also make the claim that it's time for also recognizing new things coming out of that context. Not, not of course, uh, over, overlooking or not omitting the destructive dimension of, of the process, but, but, but also taking into account what came out of, of the contact uh, as new plants, new crops, new techniques, uh, and also adaptation of, of all social groups involved to these changes. For instance, they they they, they stress that uh, the demographic recovery that took place in, in some parts of the American continent, uh, not exactly right after the conquest, but uh, decades or even centuries later, is also a result of the adaptation capacity for the, of adjustment of populations from different uh, sectors, ethnicities, and races to to this change. Um, and, and they also make the claim that for this circulation of, of, of plants, we, we need to consider all sectors of society. For instance, they, they include many studies in which uh, the agents of this circulation are people, men and women from lower groups, enslaved persons also playing their role in bringing plants or adapting new crops to to their own conditions in, 
Latin America. So would you would you find similar processes taking place in the sources that you just presented or not really? So this is the first question. For Miguel, just a remark, a very interesting presentation too. And uh, your reference to, to, to the Christianized Chinese uh, who incorporated Catholic prejudices against Jews reminded me of a, of a book written by Portuguese who lived in Peru in the 1620s and the Viceroy of Peru. 1620s, and the book was published in 1630, Lourenço de Mendonça, and he says that, um, well, he's complaining about the, the way the Portuguese were being treated by Spanish authorities, treating them not just as, as uh, foreigners, but also being discriminated against and accused of being new Christians. And he says that the situation was so dire that even the indigenous peoples were um, surprised with the fact that 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 uh, that the Portuguese were being so mistreated and accused of being uh, of being new Christians or even practicing Judaism. This, the, the man is Lorenzo de Mendoza. I've, I've published a, a couple of pieces on on this book, and I think it's well known. But so it seems that there is a global scope of this. Um, accusations or prejudices against the Portuguese uh, being classified as 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 uh, new Christians or even Jews. So thank you. Let's just say that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, Pedro. Um, as I mentioned, the circulation of land is a very complex process. It has positive but also negative consequences. As negative consequences, we find that some of the native land will almost disappear because of the introduction. For example, it makes we have the coconut palm tree that, that came from Asia. We had many benefits from the people on the coast because we had um, what to, to drink, to eat, we also had houses from the rest. But one of the negative concepts is that um, native uh, palm almost disappeared uh, as a consequence of the introduction. Um, and I document that on, on my book. Um, then, after the introduction of the formula, there are some grains of um, native origin in Mexico that almost disappeared. But then you have the opposite. You have um, a, com a complementary process. For example, I talked about the wheat and the negative consequences. But then in some parts of New Spain, when there was um, shortage or when corn was short, you had the wheat, the complement. And in the Philippines, when rice was short, then you had the corn, the substitution. Um, so we cannot see the things in black or white, and we have to see, um, we have to see, and um, how can I say, the region in which we are talking about. Um, other thing that is really interesting to me is that we have like second domestication. Yeah. I mentioned in my presentation that Manuel Blanco said that the chili was native to the field. But they talk of a second domestication of a variety of chili, which is called Tilinabuyo in the Philippines. And they say that this Tilinabuyo, which is really small, had a second domestication in the field. So they say that it is from the Philippines, even if the species is from America. Um, the piña, well, you are an expert in the piña, but they speak of a second domestication of the piña in the Philippines because they uh, have cultivated the piña. So the leaves are longer for the production of clothes. So we don't find that, for example, in the Netherlands. Um, I can think of many, many of the examples as a consequence of the circulation of the um, as you mentioned, it has it has it has many consequences in this normal circulation. 
but we don't have to see that mm -hmm. black or white. So it's a very complex phenomenon. Thank you for your question. Miguel, you want yeah, to? Yeah, it's um, I think for the for the reference. Um, well, what, what, what I find interesting in the case of the, the, the Japanese Christians is, um, well, in, in, in Spanish societies, we will find uh, specific moments where anti-Portuguese sentiment take on, uh, also an anti-Jewish uh, sentiment erupting in um, moments of prosecution, that's moments of prosecution by uh, because of the real fact is that um, happened in Manila briefly in the late uh, 16th century as well. This is the context in which some of um, these Japanese Christians denunciations take place as well. But we also have that in my design. So that is what I, I find striking is that um, um, the, the process of Christianization in Nagasaki itself came, came to um, came to, su to such depth in terms of interconnection with Portuguese culture that while well, Portuguese culture of the 16th century being so heavily anti-Jewish, this also transferred to um, the sensitivities of these scene on Christianity. But uh, but it's certainly striking that uh, the local population in the we're also talking about. It. Thank you, <clears throat> Harriet. I think Harriet uh, would like to take a question. So please. Oh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Hi. Okay. My question is to Mark. Mark, um, I was curious about the division you made about weather circumstances in northern areas of Asia and the distinction between that and southern areas. And I was thinking here also of southern China, uh, especially in relation to figures, um, statistics that Richard von Glan, the economic historian published concerning rice prices, silk production, and moreover the importation of silver from Japan, which you can think of Japan more Northern than um, Guangzhou where the silver entered. So, I wonder if you could say more about this, because I have the impression that, at least from what from Glan's work showed, that this weather conditions in the North that certainly had a relationship with the rebellions in Northern China, but really didn't affect business, economic activity, and everything else that was going on in Southern China, which is more where the economic situation was pro still prospering. That's my question to you. I think uh, I think I think it's it's in the right from what the the literature that I've read. I think it's in the what people historians would argue that you'd need a more sort of localized uh, studies of these because we, most of the time when you talk about climate it's in terms of regional or even global trends and patterns but in reality you'd have to take into account different uh, effects in different regions because sometimes regional pat weather patterns are not are very localized in certain cer areas but sometimes it's not connected with certain areas even with certain global patterns I would say and so maybe it's a possibility other from what I've read from Victor Lieberman, his argument is also sometimes, you know, sometimes there are more robust institutions as well. His argument is by the 17th century, there were much more robust institutions in mainland Southeast Asia. So even if there were droughts or famines, 
the, the administrative reforms were able to actually cope better with all of these drastic changes in the climate as well. So you can factor in the climate, maybe it's their variations at the local level, but at the same time, you can look into the institutional capabilities of the different states and polities at that time that maybe this would explain certain differences in terms of the responses. Maybe they had the same economic, uh, environmental sort of catastrophic environmental experience, but it would not necessarily result in the in the same result, depending on maybe it's the different weather or maybe different institutional capabilities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mark, don't disappear because I think uh, Paulina has a question for you. <laughs> thank you, Mark, for your presentation. I, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, could you please repeat the stores where you got the information of the cellulario, the, the Filipinas, and the average of days of the galleon, um, 80 days and 120 days. So that is for the source. And the second question, it's more like a comment or than a question. You mentioned that the concept of uh, natural hazard uh, should be employed uh, because it's more neutral and not disaster or catastrophe. Um, it's a comment because I work with uh, people um, that are called themselves desastrolo. That's in Spanish <laughs> because they are historians of disasters. And I think that uh, there are different concepts because natural hazard. But yeah, maybe it's neutral, but disaster is always a social construct. Uh, disaster is a social construction. So when you have a disaster, it's because somebody should have done something and did not do that. Um, so these historians, these astrologers, are called themselves by that because they always see the action or inaction of, of social um, activities of, or people that are equal and they did not do that. So just to make the distinction of the concept and that is all Mark. thank you very much. On the, on Louis Derry's uh, book, it's titled Pestilence in the Philippines. Uh, a social history of the Filipino people. So in the in the appendix, he would he compiled a list of all of the sort of disasters that happened of the droughts as we saw in the in the slide that I presented. The one on the atmospheric circulation, I think it's titled "Atmospheric Circulation Changes in the Tropical Pacific," <clears throat> inferred from the voyages of the Galleons of Manila. Okay. Where was it published? Thank you. I think I can. I think I think it was published in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society in two thousand one. Okay. On the issue of the disasters, I think it's only in the sense that. It becomes a sort of foregone conclusion, I guess. I think the some environmental historians don't like the term disaster because from the very start, there's always an assumption that sort of these natural occurrences are negative in by themselves. And I think, like you mentioned, you know, I think if you a more neutral term would be not at least from their perspective, it would be natural hazard because they're sort of you don't try to paint it in a particular light as well. And maybe it's right, you know, it, when the disasters are not necessarily down to the climate or weather themselves, but it can also be down to the response of the different people. Because, I mean, you have the same environmental or weather disruptions, and then certain communities would survive, like mentioned earlier, but in some cases they would experience some sort of collapse. So I guess in those cases, you know, maybe per se, this sort of a drought or a weak monsoon does not necessarily lead to disaster in some cases. So maybe, I guess it's, it's just a, a more neutral term for sort of these environmental events rather than something that's 
from the very start, you'd assume that it would lead to. I think it's more of the sort of the the connotation that these events, typhoons, floods, weak monsoons, would always lead to disaster when most of the time they're hazards, but it depends on how people actually respond to these sort of natural hazards. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Um, we have time for some few questions more, some more questions. So if anyone has questions, would like to raise the question, please go ahead. No, no more questions? No questions. Okay, so maybe we can just stop here and, and go directly to the presentation of your book, which is this next item on the list. So would that be okay? Okay. Yeah. Five minutes. Yeah, no problem. We can we can uh, make a pause for five minutes so, so that you can get ready and uh, clear it and write. Yeah, I have one. Sorry, it's already on the on the computer or Sorry, we cannot hear. Estamos preparando la, la preparación. La okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Thank you.
So here we go. Can everybody hear us? Is everybody okay? I guess. So we have the four. So we have the two editors of the volume and two authors. Very happy to have all these all these colleagues here. And so we'll just give the floor to you guys and thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, we won't take uh, much time to present the book that we published in June. And Samora uh, It's a book that uh, is the result of a symposium uh, that we that was held at Sciences Po Paris in 2000. Oh, it's already there. 2017. And uh, that gather uh, the structure from Spain, France, Mexico. Uh, the Portuguese researcher, okay. Miguel, and they were all specialists on the art, uh, all specialists in the Iberian monarchies, uh, some of whom were particularly interested in the Philippines. Um, and this book, the, the main idea was to say, in the Spanish Empire perspective, Philippines are periphery. Because they are the the rain, the rainbow, the kingdom, the kingdom most remote from the from Madrid and from from Mexico, and at the same time, Philippines are uh, in the center of uh, of Southeast Asia or China, Japan uh, relations, trade, etc. So the question was. At which point it is a periphery, at which point it is a central, no? Like try to, to make this at the same uh, moment. And we, and so there is a three parts. One, it is the question that if Philippines are a special Spanish world, what are the specificities of this place? And the second one is about um, individual mobilities uh, from in Philippines or from Philippines, people who are traveling uh, to Philippines or uh, in different places. And then it was about the question of modernity. What is the, the role of uh, Philippines in, yeah, in mod modernity? Like uh, the question of the, the katana and long uh, it's like techniques or technology that 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 circulate from uh, Mexico, Philippines, from Japan, uh, from things like that. And the, the final uh, paper is very interesting about the nineteenth century. When uh, new new transports uh, were put on, like uh, steam steam boats, that permit to connect like uh, Philippines with Spain in in days or one month, and uh, this is the moment when uh, Philippines gets its independence. So it shows that. Sometimes this distance or remoteness is a good way to, to govern. And when the distance also reduces, the reduction of distance. Well, the, yeah, the reduction of distance times could be a problem. Another paradox, another paradox uh, is the idea of the last paper. But maybe I have to hear my. Uh, and to contribute so I think then we better than first of all I'd like to say that this is a very particular presentation of Topolos because normally there is somebody who has read book like presentations comments etc that's what that's true. So it is kind of um, a, a particular moment. But uh, I 
I think this, this talk, I think this seminar is a consequence of this talk. Uh, because there are many um, elements and even some of the chapters, which I will mention, that are related to the discussion this morning. Um, as as you mentioned, there are three parts of the book. Um, all of the people that um, participate in this book are specialists in the field. They are Filipinista. Just um, the, the first chapter is mine. It's about the earthquakes in the Philippines and how um, the distance is an attack an obstacle for the government in New Spain or the history in New Spain to reconstruct the buildings because um, it is a long voyage of the Manila Galleon and the correspondence take a long time so the reconstruction is really, really um, difficult for the people in the Philippines. Then we have the, the chapter by Luis Ponzo Alvarez Maybe you know him. He's, um, he's an important feminista. And Luis Alonso talks about the consequence for the agriculture in the Philippines of the introduction of the flow, the arado in Espanol. Um, <laughs> because the flow was imported from China, it was not used in the Philippines. So they the Spanish arrive and they know the flow, of course, but then it comes from China and there is an impact in the production level of rice in the Philippines. Then we have the work of uh, Clotilde Jacquelard, uh, she in France, of course, um, and she talks about the pacification the pacification by the Jesuits. Um, and she, she makes an analysis of the work of Francisco Polini of Sikkim. Then we have the work, the chapter by Marta Maria Manchado Lopez. Um, she makes a social analysis of the violence level in the field. There is a lot of violence uh, in the society, uh, which is a result of many, many things. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to explain that here. But uh, it, it is also an, an interesting chapter, Convivencia and Conflicto. Then we have the second part, the, um, the imperial um, trajectory, trajectoria. Um, we have the, the work by Guillaume Luna, um, which is about the uh, Oidor, the Matias Delgado Flores. Uh, so he, he makes an analysis of his career in the Philippines and the difficulty he finds there. Um, and you know, the, the, um, the importance of the connections with the families and the people uh, in Madrid and in Manila. You have to know somebody in order to get better positions, etc. And if you lose that person in Madrid, you are in problem then. Uh, then we have the work by Delphine Tenver. Um, she, she talked about uh, Sebastián Gutiérrez. It's like a biography of this person who goes from, um, he travels uh, a lot of um, places and he passes by the city. Then we have the work by Miguel Rodriguez Lorenzo, who is going to talk about his, his article then. Um, but it's an inquisitorial text which he analyzes. Then we have another, another chapter by Salvador Bernabeu Albert, also with inquisitorial processes. But this time he analyzes a soldier called Jose Maria Rodriguez at the end of the 18th century. Then we go to the last part of the book, uh, Las Filipinas en la Era Global, uh, Opportunities, Inflation, Modernity. We have the work by Thomas Dalton, who is here, and who analyzes how, for the first time, for a Japanese 
he has in his hands. Uh, we don't know how to say it, but a long, um, just be you know, um, far from distance. Um, it was invented in by the Dutch, but then he had that in his hand and he discovered how modernity goes from here to there, from uh, Europe passing by Spain and then to Asia, and how people from Japan and China adopt this kind of artifacts. We have to work then by Patricio, Patricio Hidalgo Nuchera. Uh, he discusses some religions in the commerce in Manila in 1834. Um, then we have the chapter by Maria Dolores Vitalde. She talks about the islands of Carolina and Palau. Uh, second half of the 18th of the 19th century. Uh, and finally, the work by uh, Javier Westerland uh, about the uh, steamboat and how it reduced um, the time for the people that went from Spain to the Philippines. And it, it is very interesting because during the 17th and then 18th century, a governor in the Philippines could last four or five years or six years because the distances were really huge. But with, uh, the, with the creation of the steamboat and the communication between Spain and then Manila, the governors um, were there for three years, maybe, or two years. Um, well, in general, this is, this is um, the content of the book. So I give the word to, I give the floor to Thomas Tavi. We're going to talk in French, I think. Yes, my, my English is not uh, very well. C'est pour cela que d'ailleurs je ne suis pas coordinateur, je suis simplement un traducteur, si vous voulez être aussi coordinateur, si j'avais parlé la langue de l'Église. Non, sérieusement. Euh, Paulina a un peu résumé ce que je présentais là. En fait, je fonctionne dans ce texte autour de trois concepts ou réalités. Modernité, migration et japonais. Le japonais qui, dans ce contexte du XVIIe siècle, peut bien tous les espagnols sont appelés les espagnols d'Asie, par le grand penseur glacien. Et il s'agit de voir effectivement en quoi le fait d'être préparé à recevoir des, des apprentissages d'ailleurs de, peut euh, fonctionner quand on est migrant, quand on n'a aucune solution de retour dans son pays d'origine, parce que évidemment, les murs ont été coupés depuis 1900, 1939 entre le Japon et pas toute la chrétienté, mais au moins avec la catholicité, et à ce moment-là, il faut se débrouiller autrement. Et j'ai le cas donc là de deux. Euh, deux japonais, l'un qui, en 1609, euh, en Hollande, la longue vue est inventée, et en 1616, dans la baie de, euh, de Manille, un premier japonais, bien entendu, c'est les Hollandais qui lui font dans l'objet, peut regarder dans une longue vue et nous décrit exactement ce qu'il voit avec cet objet si extraordinaire. Le deuxième cas est différent, mais c'est un tout petit peu plus tard, vers 1620. C'est un autre Japonais qui se trouve en Nouvelle-Espagne. Il y a en Nouvelle-Espagne un lit de camp à monter pour le roi. Et on l'envoie avec le lit de camp à monter auprès de la Filica. Il va donc se trouver face à face au Japonais avec Filica. Et dans les, dans les mois qui suivent, Évidemment, il doit, il doit se tourner, il est à Madrid, qu'est-ce qu'il fait à Madrid Eh bien, il, il met en marche une, une grande habileté à manier, en quelque sorte, les institutions espagnoles, de telle sorte que, finalement, le compte le roi intervenant auprès du compte le roi même, hein, dans le signe, etc., intervenant auprès du conseil des Indes, on lui fait le retour à un grand projet. C'est pas possible pour lui. On lui fait le retour au conseil c'est déjà pas mal, et en même temps, on lui offre le statut de euh, fonctionnaire, c'est-à-dire interprète des Japonais de film. 
les deux interventions. Ça me permettra de gagner un peu de temps pour cette appel de Thank you. Uh, the Guillaume told me that long view is the Thank you. <laughs> well, as for myself, I have to say that um, the, the, the choice of the theoretical framework elected by uh, the organizers of this conference that took place in Paris in what, 2017. Yeah. Um, resonated to me in quite an important manner as a means to understand how societies and the Inquisition adjust to one another. Um, usually the perception of how the Inquisition works is that the Inquisition acts on society, but the Inquisition at the same time requires society to, to produce a certain accusation in order to be able to act. So when, when we find um, a significant amount of accusations against Portuguese in Christians in the positions of Judaism, what does that mean? Does that mean that the Inquisition in Mexico, in spite of the distance, is acting on the Philippines or what is happening there? Because scholarship usually understands as this being this unidirectional um, uh, dynamics between the Inquisition and society. And when, and so the question that I posed in the title of the article, is there a, a cycle of inquisitorial repression in the Philippines? What I see is that actually the Inquisition only ordered for the, um, the arrest of one individual out of the five that were either detained or uh, accused. So this pertains to, to the discussion that the discussion that I was having with Putin just a few moments ago. There is a moment of anti-Portuguese sentiment that takes on an anti-Jewish um, well umbrella to say about that. Um, that likely has to do with the need of Manila society to adjust itself to the increasing prominence of Portuguese traders uh, in the city. So this is more or less um, the approach that I have to make in the uh, in this book. Yeah. Thank you very much, Miguel. And thank you very much. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, everybody. So I think that we'll just conclude this session for this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you again to all the presenters for all the questions and for this great presentation of this very nice book, which we all ought to read, I guess. Okay. Thank you very much. And so we'll see you at 2 p.m., 2.30 p.m. Uh, for the Thank you. Yes.